Yesterday, as I was casually sauntering around the internet, enjoying my time transversing cyberspace via a screen, I came across something surprising for the internet. I found something. Something stupid. Something annoying. Something filled with mistakes, lies, and half-truths. If you can believe it, I did find it on the internet. What I found is an article from CBR.com written by a man named Jamie Parker, and published a mere two days ago. The headline of the article is, The Star Wars EU is Dead. Time to Accept It. And I think that title's quite forceful, and a little harsh, and I feel a little targeted for this. But I wanted to read this article, and put some things in perspective for it, because there's a lot of stuff here that in this article is simply not factual, is simply wrong, or is simply misleading, and it's very, very annoying. The opening statement provides all we need to know for the rest of the article. Jamie Parker writes, The Star Wars Extended Universe was beloved by fans, but it's long dead. It's time for fans to accept the EU is dead and embrace new Star Wars stories. Alright, he called it the Extended Universe. As soon as you see the word extended universe instead of expanded universe, you know that the person writing the article has no clue what they are talking about. Extended universe, and I immediately write them off as not knowing their stuff. Jamie Parker's article continues, Star Wars is undoubtedly one of the most popular franchises in the world, not just in film and television, but through books, comics, and video games also. The Star Wars universe expands through so many mediums, it can be hard to keep track of all the different stories. Before Disney purchased Star Wars, the extended universe <laughs> was the home of all these stories. When Disney bought the franchise, the EU ended, but many fans refused to let it go. Ooh, we're so scary, aren't we? We're so toxic for liking something and refusing to let it go and grappling with it. Shame on us. That's a real slap on the wrist from Jamie Parker. For all of us, really. While there is nothing inherently wrong with holding on to stories that bring joy to fans, it becomes a problem when it acts as a barrier to entry to people trying to enjoy new Star Wars stories. Now I do see his point here. Some EU fans, myself included, have from time to time made it hard for Disney Star Wars fans to enjoy their stories because we've been a little bitter. And I think that needs to stop. People can enjoy the new Disney Star Wars stories, and we can enjoy our old Star Wars EU stories. The two can coexist in harmony and in peace. We don't have to stand in the way of people liking the new Disney Star Wars stories. And while I don't think liking the EU is inherently a problem that causes people to have this barrier for enjoying the Disney Star Wars stories, I think it's important that the EU can exist to give an alternative to these new Star Wars fans so that they can see that there's something else out there if they want to dip their toe in. We don't have to bar them, the new fans, from the Disney Star Wars timeline. We don't have to discourage them. We can let them like what they like, and we can like what we like. The two can coexist. But here we're made out to be the villains. Jamie Parker's article continues. The old Star Wars EU, now referred to as Legends, began in 1978. Wrong. It began in 1976 with the novelization of A New Hope. So, he's saying it began in 1978 with Splinter of the Mind's Eye, but that is factually inaccurate. The EU started two years earlier in 1976. So, again, not well researched. This guy doesn't know what he's talking about. So, it says, began in 1978 when the first Star Wars novel came out. From that point onward, countless books, comics, and video games continue to expand on the story started by George Lucas. These stories told the tales of Luke, Han, and Leia after the Rebellion. They explored the years before the prequels and looked at everything in between. One of the most famous and beloved eras of the Legends canon was the Old Republic. Yet in order for Disney to be able to tell any new stories, the cancellation of the EU had to take place. And it says, the death of the Star Wars EU was necessary and for the best. Now this is an argument that's been made so many times. Disney needed creative freedom to make their movies and the EU was getting in the way and it was going to be all messy for them, right? We've all heard this. I don't think that's necessarily the case. 
Look at what Disney did with the creative freedom. They created the most disjointed trilogy, like, in all of history, in all of film history. They didn't have a plan going in. So what does creative freedom mean if you don't have a plan? The EU was an outline for the perfect plan. These stories were already beloved. You could work around them and set them after Crucible or after Legacy or before the Thrawn trilogy. You could put movies that you could make anywhere around the EU timeline or just simply adapt it. You could have worked with it. You could have still had creative freedom within the EU. The EU was a sandbox that has a lot of sand that is still ripe to be played with and molded into castles. It's a great sandbox. It's There's so much great opportunity still left in the EU. Working within the EU does not deny creative freedom, but they thought that the EU was going to hamper them down. And so they wanted creative freedom. And look what they did with that. Delivered the most loved trilogy by its fan base. And that is obviously sarcasm. Continuing with the article, Disney was obviously looking to tell new stories in the Star Wars universe, and in order to do that unencumbered, look at that, he's using his big vocab words now, Disney needed to kill the extended universe. It, it still grinds my gears that he's not calling it the expanded universe, just tells you all you need to know about the writer. If Disney had kept the EU intact, then it would have almost been impossible to find space to tell new stories in Star Wars. I find that to be wrong. There was a 70-year gap between Crucible and the Legacy comics, but moving on. The company would have ended up either just adapting books and games, or it would have had to find small spaces to tell stories in between the events of Heir to the Empire or Shadows of the Empire. So he named two parts of the EU. <laughs> But, so, you're telling me, tell stories in between the events of Heir to the Empire, and what? You're saying that they could make a movie set in between the pages, the chapters of Heir to the Empire story? What about Shadows of the Empire? That takes place between Empire Strikes Back and Return of the Jedi. What movie would you be looking to tell in between? It's clear that he just picked out popular parts of the expanding universe and dropped them into the article. Without doing research. There's so many places that have huge spaces for a huge amount of more story within the EU. There are literal decades and centuries of untold stories within the EU. And what's wrong with adapting books and games? These books and games are incredibly well received and loved by the audience. All you have to do is try to stay true to that story and you could have an incredible film. Jamie Parker continues though with this article by saying that killing the EU allowed total freedom for the franchise. Wrong. While Disney's promise of one consistent canon has not been kept, with many Star Wars books being continually retconned, and it links another article. Now, I do think that at least he has some self-awareness here. The Star Wars Disney canon timeline is already a mess, and it's funny to me that he's already noticed that the <laughs> Disney Star Wars canon timeline has not been kept well. It's already messy. It's already retconning it itself like crazy. It's by no means perfect. I'd argue there's already been more contradictions in the Disney canon than in the EU timeline, and it's been nine years compared to 38 years. But that aside, at least there's some self-awareness here, and yeah, the Star Wars books of the Disney canon timeline are continually being retconned, so it's good that he points that out. He continues though, for better or worse though, transitioning from the EU to the sidelined Legends canon lent to the creation of shows like Andor and The Mandalorian. It would have been difficult to create a new history of Mandalorians or create characters like Cassian Andor if the EU was still in existence. Well, my friends, as some of you may know, Cassian Andor is already in the expanded universe. And the story Interlude at Dark Now, written by Timothy Zahn and Michael A. Stackpole, published in 1999 in the Tales from the New Republic uh, Bantam book, uh, we got a short story called Interlude at Dark Now, which involved Senator Garmbel Iblis and an agent that had a unknown identity in a mini adventure. And it's set around the time of Force Unleashed. Uh, I think it's in around zero BBY, somewhere around there. And a character appeared with a code name. The code name being Ach, A A C H. It was a human male member of the Rebel Alliance named Och. That was his code name. That is the same code name Cassian Andor has in the Rogue One movie. So, Cassian Andor is already in the expanded universe as this unnamed codename, Och. The same codename for Cassian Andor. Cassian Andor is already in the EU. So I don't understand why this article says that Cassian Andor 
couldn't have worked in the EU. He very well could have. The story of Andor could have fit within the EU, and the character already exists there. So what's difficult about creating Cassian Andor in the EU when he already exists there? Plus, the history of the Mandalorians, we have multiple interpretations of it. it well, that wouldn't be hard to do. You could change it again. Filoni already changed the history of the Mandalorians in the EU. It could be done again. It's not that difficult. The article continues with a new headline that says, Star Wars continues to borrow from the Legends canon, which is something we're all very annoyed about. Despite Disney canning the EU, the franchise has continued to borrow and adapt aspects of the beloved stories anyway. Grand Admiral Thrawn, part of Mandalore's history, and even aspects of the New Republic have all been borrowed from the old EU. Ahsoka and Dave Filoni's movie will even be adapting Heir to the Empire. Cue the Noah reaction. That looks bad. No! About Thrawn's return. No! As heir to the Empire. While this has upset some Star Wars fans, others understand that it is what is best for Star Wars in the old EU tales. Well, that's a subjective opinion. He is literally just outright stating that this is what's best. If you disagree with me, you're wrong. This is what's best for Star Wars. This is what's best for the EU. Scraps of it adapted and changed and formed into something else in a new timeline that's not part of the old timeline. So basically, he's saying that cherry-picking the EU is what's best for it. That's not what the fans of it want. That's changing our characters. What we want is a continuation of our story. This is not doing that. This is not what's best for the expanded universe. The article continues, The EU had some good stories, but it was largely cluttered with way too much information. Uh, I would say it's less all over the place than the Disney canon based on what I've heard about it. Picking and choosing what parts of the EU make it to the Star Wars canon is the best way to move forward. Well, thank you for your opinion, Jamie. The Star Wars Extended Universe was a huge part of Star Wars history, but it is just that. History. That's a little offensive. You're calling my franchise that I care so much about, my universe that I care so much about, history. The EU is dead, and fans need to finally accept it. Well, it's not really dead. I mean, there's still content coming out in it, as outlined in this video that I made. So go watch that if you'd like. So the EU isn't dead. The fan base is growing stronger. But here he is, Jamie Parker, claiming that the EU is dead and fans need to finally accept it. Odd. He continues, Disney will continue to use whatever they want from the old stories, and that is absolutely for the best. I would, again, argue that that's a subjective opinion. For all the hype surrounding the EU, it was largely a mess, and its death makes Star Wars better. Ooh, that ended on a great note that just gets my blood boiling. Ugh. It's nasty to read this. It genuinely grinds on my mental state. The whole the EU is largely a mess thing is a ridiculous notion that has been dispelled many times, numerous occasions, by numerous members of the Expanded Universe community. The EU was not a mess. Although it was originally a mess, perhaps, a lot of it was retconned into being a seamless continuity, which was very, very good. Now, some of my biggest takeaways from this article from Jamie Parker titled The Star Wars EU is Dead, Time to Accept It, again, a very aggressive title, is that it takes this standpoint that so many modern Star Wars fans take, and that is this standpoint that assumes that a reboot was always going to happen, a reboot was inevitable, it was going to happen. For some reason... They look at a reboot as being a good thing, and that it gives creative freedom that's necessary for films to work and work within the universe, but in actuality, it muddies things further. There's one timeline. By creating multiple ones with reboots, you make it messier. Having one timeline is the way to go. I just don't understand why so many fans of today and so many articles fall into the same trap of assuming that a reboot is for the best. It's not. That makes things muddier than they were before. What is also interesting is that it keeps appealing to this need that we need to let go of the EU and that we have to leave it behind to embrace the new Disney canon. 
Something that Christopher Nelson pointed out to me as we were talking about this before I made this video is that you can like both. You can like both the Disney canon and the EU. Now, I personally only like the EU, but one could like both timelines and follow both timelines. So, it's so weird that these articles ask us to let go of it, accept that it's dead, let it slip away from our fingers, and move on. We don't need to do that. We can follow the EU and the Disney canon. There's many people who are doing that. Stevie B or Star Wars Discussion. There's many people who are following both timelines. There's numerous other examples, obviously, but those are just two I highlighted. There's so many people who can follow both. It's not like we're grabbing on with white knuckles to one timeline. Well, I guess some of us are, but we don't have to let go of that love and fervor for the EU to follow the new timeline. But for some reason, they all assume that we do. What else is interesting is that I see this as a good thing. And as Scott Johnson and Christopher Nelson pointed out to me, this article, while infuriating to read, as it just takes pot shots at me and many of my friends within this amazing community, is that this means that we're a threat to them. For whatever reason, they see us as dangerous and they see the EU as still um, a force to be reckoned with. They wouldn't have made this article telling us that it's time to accept it if they didn't need to. There's a fear of the EU because the EU is better. The EU is still loved, is still alive, and is attracting new fans all the time. So they keep telling us that we need to accept it, that it's dead, that it was messy, that it's pointless, that it's history, that it's already in the grave when it isn't. And that's because they fear us. Now, should they fear us? I don't think so. We just want the EU to coexist with the Disney canon, with new content in the EU and new content in the Disney canon. We want a continuation of the timeline we love alongside the new timeline. That way we can be happy too. That way you can embrace us, the older fans who have been there longer, well, most of us. You can embrace us too and give us what we want as well. You can give us the EU content that we really, really want and they just don't want to do that for whatever reason. They want to keep telling us that it's dead. They don't want us to think it's alive. And so it's a good sign that they view us as a threat, I suppose. And that's one of my main takeaways from this. What did you guys think of this article? I was very frustrated as soon as I saw it. And as soon as I saw it, I just laughed aloud and said, I'm making a video about that. That's really annoying to me. I'm going to shred that to pieces. So what did you guys think of this article? Were you frustrated by it? Do you see this as a good thing like I have learned to?